Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, I want to thank all of you who have uh, stuck around a little bit past our uh, starting time. Um, Good evening. Thank you for uh, happening just after our um, AGM. I want to thank today. all of you who have uh, stuck around. Sorry, there's a bit of an echo. Can I get folks to mute, please? Thanks. Um, yeah, so this uh, uh, live stream happens right after our uh, annual general meeting. So as these things tend to do, it ran a little bit over time, uh, but we're very excited to bring you our speaker for this evening. Uh, first though, I'd like to acknowledge um, with respect the Sanchatan speaking peoples on whose traditional territory the observatory stands and on whose traditional territory we live, work and play. Oh, it's, uh, the, um, it's the YouTube the recording, right? Peoples on whose traditional territory the observatory right. stands. And on whose um, ben, it's, it's coming from your feed, I think, from your audio. Yeah, I'm getting an echo. Okay, okay. should be good. Um, right, so uh, we acknowledge with uh, the Sintathan speaking peoples on whose traditional territory the observatory stands and on whose traditional territory we live, work, and play. We share with those peoples historical relationships with the night sky. Hang on a second, please. Um, Calvin, I think it's the YouTube recording that's coming across. Oh, your? You can... No, it's not on mine. Oh, hold on. Is something still Can you guys unmuted? use chat? Uh, hold on. Who isn't muted? The stream, the stream is muted. I'll mute all and then unmute you, Aaron. All right, hopefully this fixes that. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm still getting it. It's it's Ben and Calvin. Ben and Calvin oh. are still... Coming yeah. from mine? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, no, just if you guys mute as well. There, yeah. Ben and Calvin are still... I, I'm mute. Yeah. Yeah. It's not me. And I don't have the YouTube up anywhere. All right, well, we'll keep going. Um, thank you for also having patience through our technical difficulties. Um, we'd love it if you'd like and subscribe to, you, uh, to our YouTube uh, channel. Um, this really helped us get these live streams out to more people. Uh, you can also find us on all the social medias at FriendsDAO. Um, this really helped us get these live streams out to more people. Uh, you can also find us on... Yeah, I'm muted. Yeah, sorry guys. Um, something's happening, and I don't even know what. Just keep going, Aaron. It's all, okay. it's all good. I have no idea where the audio is coming from. Calvin, you and Ben just need to keep unmuted, and it's fine. I am muted. You're on. You know, you're not. No, no. You sorry, I was muted. Just, Let's no, try it again. was fine. It was fine Rick. when you were muted. Just there. Rick. All right. Um, I'd like to. Um, just quickly go over our schedule for the evening. Um, we've got, uh, first up, a video that was recently taken of the telescope mirror getting uh, its surface re-silvered uh, or re-illuminized uh, in that giant big tank uh, downstairs in the telescope. So that'll be really cool. Uh, then we'll have our talk from, uh, uh, from Dr. Brenda Matthews, who will be telling us about the, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array and some of the amazing science coming out of that uh, observatory, which um, the uh, NRC uh, helped build. Actually, some of the antennas were, uh, pieces of the antennas were built on the hill uh, here in Victoria. Following that, we'll have a few minutes for questions and discussion, um, followed by uh, Don uh, Moffat talking, or sorry, Zorro, uh, talking about what's up in the night sky this evening. Uh, some uh, cool stuff might be happening tonight, actually. Looking forward to that. Uh, and finally, we'll finish it up with some uh, electronically assisted astronomy with uh, David and company. Um, we were hoping to be able to use the Plaska tonight. Unfortunately, there's a technical issue up on the hill, uh, and so we are unable to do that. But uh, David and the other EAA folks always have some fantastic pictures to share. Uh, so with that, who do we have uh, showing us the video? Yeah, who's got that video up? Um, 
Did Lori, you had the uh, the illuminizing video of the mirror? Lori's not there. Oh, uh, okay. I can't remember who like had it. <laughs> Um, maybe we can switch to next time. Uh, sure. So we'll, uh, um, we'll move on uh, to our uh, feature speaker. Um, I have, I have that. Some... Yep. Oh, Ben, you've got it. Okay. All right, so to uh, briefly introduce the video, um, the mirror that we have in our telescope is a giant piece of glass, but unlike your bathroom mirror, it's got uh, its reflective part on the front surface of the mirror, uh, the part that directly touches the air. Um, in your mirrors at home, that's usually hidden behind a layer of glass. Uh, on this one, we wanna have as little as possible between the light um, coming into the telescope and uh, our camera. Uh, so putting the mirrored surface right on the front of the mirror helps with that. But that means it degrades over time and we have to change it out every few years, uh, our camera. So with that, let's head to our video. But that means it degrades over time and we have to change it out every few years, our camera. So with that, let's Yeah, Ben, that's coming from you. Yeah. That echo. I'm not, I'm not sure how. OK, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know either. What causes that? If uh, if like you you said you don't have the the uh, the YouTube stream up right, yeah, that's, that's not there. So, well, Calvin, I think you're fine. If you if you just mute and let Ben talk, you I think everything is fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, I guess I'll narrate a bit through the video. So, what they have to do is bring this cart underneath the telescope. Uh, they're unbolting a piece at the bottom that holds the mirror into place. Lots of, uh, they're not rivets, they're bolts, yes. Lots of bolts they have to unscrew. They bring it down on this hydraulic jack, and there's the mirror. They do it, they're doing an inspection to see how it fares. So uh, what they've just done there is they've um, cleaned off the uh, there we go. Uh, so what they've done there is they cleaned off the um, silvering that was already on the mirror. They can't do that by scrubbing it because they'll actually scratch the mirror too badly. They have to dissolve it away. Then they use the crane to move it into the front of the tank, turn it sideways. And then inside that tank, um, in the larger section, are heating elements, very similar to what's in your oven at home. Um, and they will uh, put some aluminum bars in there, yeah, and then heat it up until the aluminum turns into a vapor. Uh, so there's the, uh, I believe those coils are made of aluminum. They're going to be, um, they produce the vapor. And then that vapor goes and spatters onto the telescope, creating a perfectly nice, smooth um, sheet of aluminum, only about one one hundredth the thickness of a human hair. There it is after the resilvering process. And then they essentially undo what they did before. They move the mirror out of the tank and up through a hole in the dome floor back into its casing. 
And then once it's on that hydraulic cart, they bring it back under the telescope after a quick inspection. There we go. And then back into place. Excellent. So that will be uh, added to the virtual tour shortly as well. Um, and I believe it will also be available on our YouTube channel. Calvin can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I can right. definitely add it to that soon. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Ernest. Uh, I just wanted to add that we have permission to put it on Facebook next week as well. So it'll be on our Facebook page as well. But, all right. Uh, now that our telescope is uh, nice and shiny, uh, let's move to a telescope that uh, doesn't need a shiny mirror, uses some uh, radio dishes. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brenda Matthews. Uh, Dr. Matthews has been with the NRC since 2004, when she joined the organization as a Plaskett Fellow. She completed her PhD in 2001 at McMaster University and was a BIMA Fellow in, radio, in the Radio Astronomy Lab at UC Berkeley until moving to Victoria. Since 2019, she's been the Millimeter Astronomy Group lead and as such coordinates the MAG and support for the ALMA telescope as part of the North American ALMA Science Center. She's an expert in millimeter and submillimeter astronomy, polarization of star forming reason, regions and interferometry. Since 2002, much of her research is focused on debris disks, circumstellar disks around main sequence stars produced by, by collisions of comets and asteroids and has authored two reviews on debris disks. She was the principal investigator of a key program on the Herschel Space Observatory, is a member of the DISCS team of the Gemini Planet Imager Exoplanet Survey, survey and is a member of an early release science team targeting exoplanets and DISCS with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, Dr. Matthews was also a member of the Canadian Astronomical Society's uh, 2020 Long Range Plan Panel and is a long-standing member of the Science Advisory Committee for the Next Generation Very Large Array. Uh, fantastic uh, credentials. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Aaron. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, asking me to come and give you a presentation about 10 years of ALMA. Uh, trans and I've titled my presentation, Transforming Our Understanding of Planet Formation in Circumstellar Disks. Uh, so what you see is basically one picture of Alma. You're going to see many more. And this is an artist's rendition of a disk around a, a disk that might be forming planets around a young star. So let me start by uh, saying what is ALMA for those not uh, in the know. ALMA is an interferometer. That means it is an array of antennas that acts together as one telescope. There are 66 total antennas in, in ALMA. Uh, they operate at an elevation of 5,000 meters in the Atacama Desert of Chile, which I've marked here on this nice map of Chile with a star. 50 of ALMA's 66 antennas are 12 meter dishes that can be reconfigured into different arrangements from very, very close together out to 15 kilometer separations. So with these different configurations, the array can act like a zoom lens um, because when you spread the dishes very far apart, they act like a very big telescope uh, that gives you good resolution. And uh, ALMA actually accesses the entire, um, or will when it's complete, uh, accesses all of the millimeter submillimeter wavelength bands that penetrate the atmosphere all the way up to a terahertz in frequency. So ALMA actually stands for the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. Um, this is a depiction of some of its dishes uh, early on in its construction. Uh, the array sits, as I said, at 5,000 uh, meters above sea level very high elevation. One does need oxygen to be working up at those elevations. Uh, most, uh, so the, this is called the array operations site on the Atacama Plain. Uh, the operations are managed from a lower site called the um, observation support facility. And uh, that's where basically most of the astronomers are most of the time. 
uh, people aren't up at the high site that frequently, although there's a pretty regular schedule of moving dishes. So that it's not like it's abandoned most of the time. It's just that most people are working at the OSF. So I'm, why build an interferometer? Uh, well, because telescope resolution goes roughly as the wavelength of the light uh, over the diameter of the telescope. So if we want to match the resolution of, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope with something in the submillimeter, we would have to build a telescope that would be two kilometers in size. And even building a dish that is about 300 feet in size or 100 meters in size uh, can come with its own pitfalls. Uh, so this is the 300 foot Green Bank Telescope, which at one time was the largest telescope in the world. And it actually collapsed under um, in 1988. Uh, the, I've met several astronomers who claim to have been the person actually observing with this telescope when it collapsed. No one was injured in the collapse, but it was completely destroyed. It was actually um, replaced by what is now the Green Bank uh, 100 meter telescope. So there is another large telescope of this scale in Green Bank now. But basically building anything uh, much larger than that, um, and especially at submillimeter wavelengths where we cannot use this kind of mesh, like this is a centimeter telescope, not a submillimeter millimeter telescope. We need a solid surface and that adds to the weight. So here's some more nice pictures of Alma. So here's some of the Alma 12 meter dishes that I mentioned in a, a configuration. So we use each of the antennas. Actually, we can think about them uh, as, as many, many pairs of antennas. And when we, we basically use the math that we understand about pairs of antennas and how they interact, uh, we can basically uh, use this ar these arrays in, in however large, long, or however spread out or com compact they are, as a telescope that acts like a single dish out to of, of size, basically on the order of the lar largest baseline that we have, so the longest baseline that we have. So when we want very lots of resolution, the uh, antennas are spread out to their 15 kilometer extension. Not all of them; some of them are still in the inner part, uh, but the, the largest separation between them would be um, 15 kilometers or so. When you want to be sensitive to things that are uh, not as small on the sky, bigger things on the sky, you want to have your telescopes in a more compact configuration. So there's these two enormous uh, antenna movers that exist for Alma. Uh, they're called Auto and Lore. They, this is one of them here. This is a picture from Louis Nee, uh, who is an NRC uh, millimeter astronomer and basically was seconded down to Alma during its construction and took this picture of the first move of a 12 meter antenna on the 8th of July, 2008. Uh, here's a picture of some of the Alma antennas in fall of 2010. Uh, and basically now I'm just gonna say, well, why do we wanna observe in this submillimeter and the millimeter in the first place? And the answer is because at those wavelengths, we're very sensitive to things in the universe that are relatively cold, things that are between about 10 uh, Kelvin and 100 Kelvin uh, emit uh, as black bodies in the regime of submillimeter, submillimeter and millimeter uh, wavelengths. And so those wavelengths are, are excellent if you want to study um, cold clouds in galaxies or molecules in the universe, and you want to understand uh, basically uh, very cold uh, disks that are around forming stars, uh, even though they're, they're, they might seem, we see them when you see them in an image, they look at, they might be very bright, they might be very warm, and, and they can be quite warm. But, but overall, the, the submillimeter millimeter universe is the regime of the cold universe. That is what we are actually studying. Uh, when it comes to um, millimeter and submillimeter astronomy, um, the atmosphere is not transparent across the whole accessible range where, where um, photons actually penetrate the atmosphere. So what you're looking at in this curve is basically a transmission curve of in this regime of around 50 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz. So this is a terahertz. So frequency increases to the right. And what you see is that the transmission is quite good here at this end, we're around nine millimeters of wavelength. But by the time you get up here to about 350 microns, uh, the atmosphere is not very transparent. In fact, these are different curves for different amounts of water vapor. And you can see that even at the Alma site in the best weather, uh, bands nine and 10, are, you're only getting at about 50% transmission through the atmosphere. Uh, so, so that is why we do not build things like Alma at sea level. We wanna get up into a desert regime where it is very dry uh, and above most of the atmosphere so we can um, actually access these high frequency bands. As was mentioned, um, Hertzberg was involved in uh, the construction of one of the receiver bands. 
on Alma. So the band three receivers, these are three millimeter receivers, uh, and they detect three millimeter wavelength. Um, we're built in uh, at Hertzberg on the mountain, and they actually fit with all of the other receivers. Each each band here has its own receiver, and it fits into this huge cryostat, uh, and then gets sealed up and filled and kept extremely cold. Because when you're trying to detect things that are extremely cold, you can't be overwhelmed with the radiation from the room temperature around you. You have to keep your receivers equally cold or colder. So the upshot of building ALMA, and it, so I should mention that basically ALMA is a partnership between Europe, uh, Asia, and North America primarily, and it is in Chile. And so Chile is kind of like, uh, is a fourth partner. Um, and each of those, these um, areas, uh, Europe and, and Asia and North America had their own ideas about a millimeter uh, array um, over the years before ALMA became a reality. But the, quite early on in the project or relatively early on, these ideas, um, they agreed to collaborate. And the product that is ALMA is actually much more than any of, it is a better facility, is more powerful than any of the facilities that were envisioned by the individual regions themselves. And so by banding together, they actually ended up with a much more, the world ended up with a much more powerful observatory uh, than we would have done otherwise. So in the end, ALMA, it, is 10 to 100 times more sensitive and has 10 to 100 times better angular resolution to objects on the sky than the previous generation of millimeter interferometers. And ALMA from the outset has really worked hard to make itself a telescope for all astronomers, not just for people who understood radio astronomy already or knew a lot about millimeter astronomy. The idea is to make it very accessible so that astronomers of any uh, level of expertise in millimeter wave astronomy can use ALMA. So ALMA has now been observing amazingly for 10 years. Uh, the first call for ALMA proposals was released on the 30th of March, 2011. Cycle zero, as, as it was called, officially began on the 30th of September, 2011. Early science used uh, not, I mentioned that there were 50 antennas in the 12 meter array. Basically the interesting thing about building an array like ALMA is that once you have an appreciable number of antennas, you don't need to have all of your antennas. Uh, once you have a significant number of them, you can actually start doing science with those, even as you continue to add antennas. So the era of cycle zero to cycle two was called early science. And basically when about 16 antennas were available, the call went out for proposals to do science. Now cycle two included the first long baseline campaign, which is when things got very interesting in terms of the protoplanetary disks that I'm gonna be showing you a little later in the talk. In cycle three, we were starting to enter full science when 40 plus antennas were generally available. And uh, cycle eight actually began on October of 2021. So this is just an example of some of the, uh, the types of objects that are observed with ALMA. So ALMA has now had in its 10 years over 2,500 publications in the scientific literature. Uh, the objects range from uh, the imaging of the black hole, of which ALMA was a major component of the Event Horizon Telescope, to objects like evolved stars. This is a debris disk. Here's a protoplanetary disk, which we'll see again in a minute. Here's some uh, galaxies. And basically, here's an outflow from a young uh, star forming object. So there's a whole many, many classes of objects observed with ALMA. But I'm actually going now to, to sort of uh, go down one avenue of, of Type, type of object that ALMA is designed to observe. So these are listed here, um, ALMA's original level one science goals that were defined well before ALMA uh, in the planning phase of ALMA. And the, the reason for defining these kind of science goals is that when you're building a big facility like this, often you reach points in the, in the planning and the construction when you might need to de-scope something to do with your facility. Things get more expensive, you don't, um, uh, there's some reason why you basically need to scale back. When you have these kind of level one science goals, you have to, they are designed so that any scale back basically should not impact these level one science goals. These are the reasons you are building the facility in the first place. So you do not want to impact adversely these science goals. The second one is the ability to image gas kinematics in a solar mass protostellar or protoplanetary disk at a distance of 150 parsecs. This is roughly the distance of the star forming clouds in Ophiuchus and Corona Australis among the closest star forming regions. Basically, ALMA was designed 
to, to observe these type of objects and to study their physical, chemical, and magnetic field structures in disks and to detect the tidal gaps created by planets undergoing formation. So uh, highlighting that as, as the key science goal that ALMA is attempting to obtain, uh, I just wanted to sort of set the stage for the, what this type of object is like. So this is just a little schematic to show sort of uh, the idea behind the formation of a planetary system. You have the original collapse of a core when a star is forming, you have the creation of an outflow and a disk around the star through which material funnels onto the star. At around a million years or so, you, you may have a disk that is no longer, um, that is kind of isolated, but still quite massive. Uh, and basically in this type of disk is where we think planets form. At later stages, tens of millions of years to billions of years, you can be left with a star and a planetary system. And although not depicted here, a circumstellar disk that is much thinner, that's called a debris disk. Uh, so the relation here has to do with uh, what we really want, we know about now are many, many, many exoplanets. And we're trying to understand how these planets form in such a wide variety of, uh, of basically semi-major axes and planetary masses. And so we're trying to understand how circumstellar disks actually achieve this, uh, this result of exoplanets. So just to mention that basically these protoplanetary disks are about typically about a few hundred AU across. And this was known before ALMA, uh, even though we did not have high, high resolution images of these disks in the millimeter uh, from other studies. And so that means that they span just a few arc seconds in total size uh, in the closest star forming regions. To actually resolve structure in the disks, we need resolution better than HST around the order of about 0 0.03 arc seconds to resolve structure on about five AU scales at that distance. So that is the target that ALMA is trying to achieve. And basically I'll talk now through some of the results. So in the earliest of the long baseline campaigns when ALMA was uh, basically, we were um, verifying and basically uh, testing long baseline observations of ALMA, HL tau was observed. HL tau is a, is a protoplanetary disk at about 450 light years. It's about a million years old, and the disk spans about 300 AU across the disk. Uh, just to give an idea of the improvement here, this was the best image of the HL tau disk before ALMA. This is a karma image. And just, uh, you can see the obvious uh, improvement. And so many, many bright rings and gaps were actually imaged through this disk. The dashed oval here shows about roughly the orbit of Neptune. And, uh, and there's a sequence of about six bright and dark rings identified in the first publication from, from this high, high, high resolution long baseline campaign. So this was in November of 2014. The observations were done at 2.9, 1.3 and 0.87 millimeters. And the 0.87 millimeter observation actually had resolution of 0 0.025 arc seconds. So 25 milli arc seconds of resolution. That's three and a half arc AU. So roughly inside of Jupiter's orbit in resolution elements uh, in the HL tau disk. So immediately we, people were very excited by this image. It was very, very transformational. It sort of immediately verified that ALMA could do what it had been designed to do. And it, so then the questions were what creates these gaps and are they really empty or are, are they really gaps carved out by planets? So just many, many papers were written about the HL tau result, but I've kind of picked two here. So one by uh, Robing Dong, who is now at the University of Victoria, uh, basically he uh, did some modeling to show that three 0.2 Jupiter mass planets uh, situated at 12 AU, 30 AU and 65 AU um, could actually carve out those kind of gaps and, and create that kind of structure observed in the disk. I should mention that this orientation that you see is because the disk is inclined to us at 46 uh, degrees. So it really is a circular disk, but we see it as an oval because of the angle of observation. And uh, another uh, school of thought was that the the dips and uh, gaps and bright bands were basically caused by condensation of dust grains into pebbles. So if you if you make your your tiny little um, dust grains that are that you're actually observing tiny little pieces of solids too large, say centimeter sizes or bigger, basically they become invisible to submillimeter detectors. And so you would then they would appear empty, but the mass would still be there. It would just be in a, a differently sized uh, solid. 
And so Zhang, Blake, and Bergen argue that basically it's this condensation of dust grains uh, aligned with uh, various condensation lines. And you can see where they've lined up water and uh, ammonia here, for example, are where the dips occur. So the arguments were that it's not that they're inherently empty, it's just that the mass has, has become invisible to a seven millimeter telescope. Now, in the case of HL tau, um, the gaps actually appear in gas as well, emission as well. So when you go in and you measure, this is done with dust, this is the solids. This is HCO plus a molecule that is quite commonly observed by ALMA. And basically you can see the gaps also in the HL tau disk there. So when the gaps are also seen in gas, that tends to indicate that the, the area has been cleared or at least uh, rarefied in, in, within the gaps. And so that does suggest a planetary origin. So there are other disks uh, that have also been imaged by ALMA. So this is an image of the uh, TW Hydra disk, and it is among the closest star forming uh, or protoplanetary disk that you could observe. It's very young, it's only about 10 mega years old, and it's almost exactly face on. So you can actually see that it's very, very circular. And you can see in, in the very, this was a very high resolution ALMA image with a resolution of about one astronomical unit. So the distance between the sun and the earth is the resolving power here. And one of the bands is at about Uranus's orbit, and this one is at about Pluto's orbit. It went very, very close to the star. They detect this gap at about a one AU, so around Earth, the Earth orbit, arguing that there is an Earth-like, um, a planet orbiting here that has an Earth-like orbit. So one of the more interesting recent observations uh, was actually the detection of a, a moon-forming disk, as they called it, around uh, the planet in the, the disk PDS-70C. So this is a forming exoplanet um, that is known to exist here. And this is basically a disk imaged around that forming exoplanet. Um, this is by Miriam Benisti et al. And, and quite a recent result. And the idea, so the planet itself is a Jupiter-like planet. Um, and this whole system is about 400 light years distant. Um, they knew about the planet already and then were able to basically image this, this dust around the planet uh, with ALMA. Now, ALMA also has observed uh, disks around older stars. So these are the type of objects I usually observe. These are debris disks. And this is an amalgamation of images from both ALMA. So this is an ALMA image, this, this one here, oops. And this one here is an ALMA image, but the rest are actually images in scattered light uh, from extreme AO systems. So these are um, optical or near infrared facilities that basically use extreme adaptive optics to get in very, very close to the stars. And they're really, they're designed like uh, the Gemini planet imager to look for planets, but they're actually very choice for looking for disks as well. Um, and so a lot, most of these are actually in the near infrared. And you can see that you see a lot of variation in disk structure uh, for these. So these are, are disks that have basically no gas in them. They are uh, created by collisions um, of bodies in these disks. And then they, um, they, they sort of are continually fed by ongoing collisions. But you can see that there's a, a variety here. We've got a double ring disc. This is beta pictoris. Uh, so it's got a warp uh, in the visible and it shows up as a brighter emission on one side in the millimeter. So this will be important in a minute. Uh, so, so this is just a summary of what are debris disks and why do we care? Uh, they're really gas poor. Uh, they're detected around about 25% of main sequence stars. And we know this from large surveys that were done by myself and other people who basically have studied uh, and looked for evidence of this, um, in this submillimeter or infrared emission from the disks around main sequence stars. And the neat thing about them is that if you just create a comet belt or an asteroid belt around a star and you just let it sit there, it may or may not collisionally evolve depending on how massive it is. But if you put planets into the mix and they start perturbing the orbits of those little rocks, they will start to collide. And so the, the presence of the, these very bright, if the debris disk is bright, we tend to think that they, it is evidence of having planetary sized bodies in the system stirring up the disk. Uh, so these are actually remnants of planet formation processes because there's no gas there. It's all just solid stuff slamming into each other. And that's the, as they grind down, we start to see the dust emission when, when the grains get very small down to um, microns in size or tens of microns in size. 
So uh, having introduced these two classes of disks, um, I'm just going to describe some results from a project that I did recently, uh, or I was part of recently, that was led by a co-op student at NRC. Uh, actually, he wasn't working for NRC. He, he, we had a postdoc working for NRC. He really wanted to work with this student, but we just couldn't make the visa work because he was not actually Canadian. But uh, he, they worked together anyway, and I was happy to be part of this collaboration, which has had some really interesting results. So I just want to share those with you. So the, the question was, can we more broadly link debris disks and exoplanets with what we are starting to understand about protoplanetary disks? And so these class uh, disks that I showed earlier, like the HL tau disk and other disks show a variety of structure. And we know uh, from studies of debris disks that about one quarter of main sequence stars show these bright debris disks left over. So there's a lot of variety in the origin of in, in the structure of disks at early times, and there is variety in the structure of disks we see at late times. Can we correlate these two things? So one thing that the debris disk community has known about for some time is that uh, if you look at the mass of dust, so mass is increasing up here, and the age of, of a disk, uh, eventually uh, you will reach a point where, where there may be a variety of, of dust masses that you see. And then for debris disks out here at 100 million years, basically there's no gas left and they're really, really low mass, like tens of lunar masses or less. And then in this regime around you know, three to 20 mega years or million years, you get a variety. They may have gas, they may not have gas. They may be a little bit massive, they may not be massive. And so something very interesting is happening in this time period around 10 million years. Uh, so the question is, how do these disks evolve between the protoplanetary and debris disk phases? Uh, so as a starting point, one can look at the impressive array of uh, young, so-called class two disks uh, measured by Alma. And many of these, the ones in this studies that I'm showing here, like the SHARP project, this was a large project on Alma by Sean Andrews and collaborators and other projects. Basically you can appreciate the amazing variety of structured disks that you can see. There's multi rings, there's some that show very little ring structure. Uh, some show asymmetries where there's brightness on one side and less on another but many of these are structured, but these were particularly targeted uh, bright disks. So if one were to think that all of the gaps that you see in these uh, structured disks were due to planets, you run into a bit of a problem because studies like the Gemini Planet Imager Exoplanet Survey have shown that basically uh, Jovian planets, the type of massive planets that could create that kind of structure on wide orbits are very rare. Uh, so this, this line, this blue line is about 3%. So the number of systems that actually have um, at late times, a Jovian planet capable of actually structuring a disk like that is very low. And yet based on these studies, one would say, well, a lot of these just show the structure. So what's happened? And the answer is that, that you need large, very complete disk surveys that go, that observe all the disks in a given star forming region, not just ones that are selected for brightness. Are, um, and, and when you do that, you realize that many, many, many of the disks do not show strongly structured rings or gaps. So, uh, so when you take the whole census of all of the disks, you actually realize that um, you need to put those structured disks in the context of the complete disk survey. So, what uh, Arnaud, the student, uh, and Nanke van der Merrill, uh, his, who was supervising him, did was basically uh, mock up basically a, a picture of how the, the dust mass of disks actually changes with age. And as one would suspect, as, as you go to um, later stages, basically the, the mass, the typical mass that you see in a disk decreases. So this was not surprising. They added this analysis of class three disks that they were able to establish via Gaia observations and actually added that in. So now we have the pictures a little bit more complete. And the very interesting thing here was that if you, uh, you make a sort of schematic of, of increasing dust mass and increasing dust emission relative to the star, and you plot up your, your young disks, 
and then you know which ones actually have structure or rings, and those ones are the ones with the diamonds and the squares, they're all the brightest disks. There's a whole population of disks that are relatively not that bright, um, but still uh, have a reasonable dust mass. If you add in the, the older ones that Arno was able to uh, establish from, from his analysis of Gaia data, you see that you sort of have filled in this area between the protoplanetary disks and the debris disks. So now we have a bit of a, a picture of how it, it sort of, these ones occupy this space. Then once you get to the class three, as they're called, they're, they're pretty low there. This red line is one earth mass of dust. And then down here in the debris phase, you've got about 25% of the disk detected. Our stars have a detected disk and 75% don't. So what does this all mean? Uh, so the really interesting thing is that the structured disks have the highest mass. And what we argue in the publication is that they are the precursors to the debris disks that we detect. There's 25% of disks have, a, have structure, uh, tend to show rings or gaps. And that population of disks is, is the parent population for the bright debris disks that have been studied for years and that are continuously found to have on the order of 25% or so uh, in, around main sequence stars. So basically the idea is that you start with a structured disk with a bright ring, and that allows the capture and formation of planetesimals into a belt like our Kuiper belt. And then uh, that is a relatively stable configuration. And over time, uh, the gas will leave the system, but you're left with those planetesimals, which are then able to collide over time and produce your debris disk. Um, so basically the, the transition, the, the rate actually, if you plot up the rate of disks that are transition disks, these very structured type disks, and you overlay uh, how this is as a function of stellar mass now. So the more massive stars on the right, and you overlay the, the debris disk uh, frequency, you can see that they actually match each other pretty well. And uh, Yankee van der Merrill and her collaborator Hei Smolders took this a little further and they asked themselves about uh, just looking at the numbers of uh, the sort of disk morphologies, exoplanets and debris disks. And they came up with this analysis which is just a series of pie charts <laughs> to say, okay, here's the low mass stars, 0.1 to 0.5 solar masses, these are M stars. Then up to solar mass stars, slightly bigger than solar mass stars and a stars basically. Uh, and the red are transition disks, blue are ring disks, green are extended disks, so large but featureless, and compact means less than a Kuiper belt in size. And what you can actually see is that if you sort of run your run your eye down from, from the top to the bottom, you can see that in each of these mass bins for the st stellar mass bins, if you, let me start at the high mass end, if you basically uh, can see that the higher the, the stellar mass, the more likely you are to have a disk around it that's got structure. You're also more likely then to have enough mass to create an exo or to have it to, to have an exoplanet present massive enough to create that structure. And you're also about 50%, the odds of you having a cold debris disk remnant detected are also about 50%. As you move to sort of lower mass stellar, uh, lower mass stars, those fractions start to decrease and you see the same decrease in the cold debris disk population. So the, they're the analog of the Kuiper belt basically. And once you get down to M stars, we have a terrible time detecting debris disks around M stars. Uh, they would be very cold and we detect them at about 2% plus or minus 5%. So consistent with zero. And similarly, even uh, those systems are very unlikely to have a structured uh, protoplanetary disk and very unlikely to host an exoplanet large enough to create structure. So that all, all makes sense together. Um, so, so just to summarize what I've, what I've kind of covered, uh, ALMA has basically met its level, level one science goal of being able to me measure evidence of gaps in disks. Uh, it has enabled the census of entire disk populations. Many disks, but not the majority of disks, show highly structured gaps and rings that suggest that planet formation is actually well underway by the million year time frame. And this has actually pushed uh, us to, to the conclusion that the earliest phases, the, seed, the seeds of planets actually begin in disks much earlier than was originally thought. Alma census of disks has enabled us to uh, 
identify a connection between protoplanetary and debris disks, which suggests that the majority of disks actually may not form planets or even belts of planetesimals, uh, and linking that as well into the exoplanet population. But ALMA is not done with what it will be doing. Uh, many questions remain, uh, particularly about this idea of seeds of planets at earlier times. Uh, also understanding the mechanisms that determine planet mass and composition. Uh, chemistry is part of that. And planet migration and evolution is also another uh, area to be studied. Uh, ALMA has set itself a, uh, three new science goals, two of which are related to protoplanetary disks. They, there is this document called the so-called 2030 roadmap. Uh, so one is understanding planet formation in the terrestrial zone. Very challenging for ALMA to get right into that 5 AU area because very close to the star, the dust becomes a, what we say is optically thick, meaning you're not actually sensitive to every single dust grain in there. The, the dust is self-absorbing essentially. Very challenging for ALMA to get in there and do that kind of work, but not impossible uh, at long wavelengths. And then also there's the role of chemistry in planet formation. Uh, so understanding sort of the chemical makeup of disks and how those transfer into planet uh, into the planets that are formed in the disks is part of the 2030 roadmap. With that comes plans to increase sensitivity, resolution, efficiency of observing so that you can go deeper on more targets uh, is all part of the 2030 picture. And in addition to ALMA, I just want to mention one other facility that will also touch very, or, or not touch on, but have as, as one of its fundamental drivers, imaging uh, and understanding planet formation in disks. And that is the next generation very large array. So the NGVLA, as it is called, um, is, is a concept to create a much more powerful um, counter, uh, successor to the very large array that exists in Socorro in New Mexico. And GVLA will be a North American wide facility with some um, antennas spread all over the North American continent. Uh, so some of the baselines will extend to um, thousands of kilometers. There'll be a core that will be hundreds of kilometers in size. So unlike ALMA that, that currently goes out to 15 kilometers, uh, this is at an even longer wavelength. So they are gonna have even longer baselines to work with. The NGVLA will measure the planet initial mass function down to a mass of about five to 10 earth masses. Uh, and unveil formation of planetary systems. And so this is just a simulation showing uh, the response of the NGVLA at three millimeters observing to a one Jupiter mass planet at five AU, a 10 Earth mass planet at five AU, and a 30 Earth mass planet at 2.5 AU. These are simulated ALMA observations as well. More challenging for ALMA when you get very, very close in because of the optical depth of the dust. And just uh, to wrap up, I show this impressive movie. So NGVLA will be able, because of the orbital motion, when you get close to the these planets that are close to the star, if you observe them over a period of years, you will you should be able to see the actual orbital motion of those planets in formation. And the idea with the NGVLA is we will do just that. So stay tuned for more exciting results. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh... I'm going to stop sharing so I can actually, well, I can see you, but. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Matthews. Uh, fantastic talk. I'm floored at the, the uh, video you just showed of what uh, the NGVLA might be able to do. Uh, Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, no kidding. Like I was, I was struck down uh, by the, the HL Towers result when it first came out, and that's even more incredible. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd like to ask uh, our audience if there are any questions for our speaker, um, either from uh, in the YouTube chat or in our um, Zoom call here. Lori, go ahead. Oh, uh, let's see, you're muted. We still can't hear you. Yeah, can't hear you, Lori. You're not muted anymore. Weird. Uh, you might have to type it into Zoom or. No, nope, still can't hear you. Okay, I'll pass oh, it no, on. Now, now, now we can. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, as I said, a year you, and a half. Be, Laurie, Laurie, you'd be a good mime. I was a good, really Thank good. You. Yeah, okay. you're. 
Um, uh, Brenda, my, I had started writing down a question about, about what if Alma can't get down to the resolution that it wants to do, and then your next slide was going down to the, to the next generation. So I said, okay, scrap that question. You know, I kind of got that far. Um, so you said that this was going to be in, in North America? Yes. Yeah, so if I bring my slide back up, uh, it is in North America. It will still be centered in Socorro. Um, so just looking down here on this, this map. Oh, here, okay. Sorry. See, yeah. It will be centered in Socorro, New Mexico. There is plans to have antennas in Penticton, uh, as well as other places around here in Hawaii. Uh, and so that you, you get those extra long baselines for what we call very long baseline interferometry. Right. Uh, yeah. So the, the bread and butter of the circumstellar disk analysis will come from sort of the, the main array that sits here centered on Socorro with baselines of about 300 kilometers or so. Uh, and you'll basically be able to achieve, and I think I have it on this slide. Yeah, uh, five milli arc second resolution. Uh, okay. And when is this supposed to go up? So NGVLA is uh, is not yet funded. It is, okay. uh, so it is led out by NRAO uh, and Canada is involved in some work for NGVLA. Uh, it has been recommended by Canada's long range plan for astronomy and yeah. we are waiting for the results. Of course, I don't know if you know this for the, the US also does a decadal review, it's called Astro 2020 and everybody it's waiting for the results to come out for that and they are due out this week. Oh, wow. So if it is recommended by Astro 2020, then the National Science Foundation in the US would potentially fund it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I imagine that uh, given that huge baseline that uh, it's going to be very much informed by the um, Event Horizon Telescope work. You're gonna be building off of that? Well, the Event Horizon Telescope is the merging of uh, sort of several different telescopes to sort of in a temporary uh, fashion, right? So mm -hmm. NGVLA, uh, so, so the VLA um, it, is interesting in that it, it uses subarrays. Uh, so a subarray is basically, uh, you're able to base to cleave off certain groups of antennas to, to point at one object and do one observation. Another group of antennas is off doing something else. So NGVLA will do that too. Uh, and so you'll be able to define subarrays. Uh, so for instance, the very compact center part of the array might be observing something different than the intermediate array and different than the extended array, depending on the sensitivity that you need or the baselines that you need, right? So it'll be project dependent, but it, it will be able to do that. And the, the plan is for on the order of 250 antennas. So there's it's quite, a, it's quite a number of antennas. Wow. Um, looks like we've got a question from Bill. Uh, yeah. Hi, Brenda. Hello. Um, how are the initial targets chosen? Like, how do you know what star to image to look for the disk? Oh, okay. That's a good question. So I mentioned that we knew that these disks were there beforehand for most of these, for most of these targets. Uh, right. not how, for all, how were they found? How were they found in the infrared? So okay. when you look at how, um, if, if you sort of observe disks in the infrared, well, in the case of debris disks, for instance, when the IRAS satellite launched in 1983, uh, one of the first things that it did was observe stars like uh, Vega, which is an, a known calibrating star in for, in many systems in the optical, for instance, right? So in the infrared, they looked at Vega. And they have, of course, uh, we know that stars emit like a black body. And so we know sort of what the, the curve should look like as you, as you go in, as you go to different wavelengths, you expect a certain flux uh, or a certain amount of emission from a star. And that's from its photosphere, right? And so what happened when they observed things like Vega and Fomalhaut and these other systems was that they saw way too much flux way too much. They were like, okay, well, something's broken, what's going on? So no, but it was it basically, if you have a, what's so-called infrared excess emission is created by the presence of this, these um, solids around, in, configured in a disc, in this case, around the star, which absorb the starlight uh, that, is, that hits them, and then they re-emits it in the infrared. It's, it's like the light gets transformed, the energy gets, some of the energy gets transformed from the star uh, peak wavelength and the visible to the infrared and that's why you see too much emission in the infrared that is the signature of the disk and so you see that in uh, by the dust these tiny little dust grains 
uh, they basically changed the emission from some of the emission from this, the star's peak in energy to the infrared, according to their size. They basically emit at a wavelength similar to their size. Yeah, so um, if, you, if you look at the spectrum from visible to infrared, um, you'll see the star's black body and then it has a little bump on the side uh, in the infrared from the black body emission of the disk at a lower temperature. Oh, that's, right. that's a good question. Hmm. Can I ask a question, Aaron? Yeah, go ahead, Janine. Hi, Janine from uh, Nanaimo, Brenda. Hi. And uh, yeah, I can't believe those two correlations that you just described between a uh, protoplanetary disk and then you traced the evolution to the debris disk. I mean, to get that correlation seems astonishing, but then to also get the correlation of the size of the stars and the number of uh, exoplanets, two correlations on like X, Y axis. I mean, that's astonishing. It's not bad for a co-op work term, is it? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so Arno, I should mention, is now a graduate student at Queen's University. That, uh, so what are the implications? Astronomy. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. So what are the implications for that new knowledge? Well, I mean, it's not universe. I mean, we haven't, we haven't, so, so one of the, the, the concerns with this correlation, right, is that it is suggestive, um, but hard, hard to conclusively say. So, so there's two papers at work there. There's the paper led by Arnaud Michel, who is the, the student, and we were really working on the, the debris disk, protoplanetary disk correlation in that paper. Then Nienke and uh, Heiss Mulders were the two who basically brought in the exoplanet angle. And the only way that you're really able, the reason they're able to do it is basically because they had at hand over 500 observations of independent disks in there. And so you need the, what we lacked before was basically statistics, right? It wasn't enough to know there was a disk there. You had to image it to know whether it was a highly structured disk, whether it was a very flat disk, whether it was very compact or extended, right? So Alma has done that. That is that is what Alma's contribution is to this, and that's what it was designed to do, right? Um, so so, I mean, what what we're getting at, and what has always baffled me a little bit about debris disks, for instance, is that, you know, we knew from from Spitzer, which launched in the '80s, that you know, most uh, stars that were sort of solar type to a little bit more massive, twenty percent or so showed these debris disks. And then when we went in with Herschel, which was the survey that I led, we didn't actually find a lot of new ones, like ones that had been observed with Spitzer where there was no disk detected, Herschel didn't find a disk either. So it wasn't like there was like, you know, it was just below the detection limit of Spitzer and they were just waiting there to be detected. There's a gap, right? So either they're absent, like they're literally not there and, or you would have to go to much deeper observations to detect them. But what this work suggests is they're just not there, right? That these disks are, they, they never form a stable sort of cometary belt of, of objects to begin with to collide and actually um, sustain a bright debris disk. Uh, so for me, that's, uh, you know, potentially a little disappointing, but I can see a future work in there. Like if someone built me a nice big single dish submillimeter telescope, I could go in and try and look much more deeply and see if I could find some of those very, because I should say we've never, the, the, the Kuiper belt um, has a, you know, it's it, the amount of emission that would appear as dust from the Kuiper belt relative to the sun is about 10 to the minus seven. It's very small. Um, and so we have never detected um, a sort of uh, that faint of the luminosity from a disk toward any other star, right? It's below our detection limits. And so we can't find things that even look quite like the solar system, right? So it exists. And so one might think others might also exist but you so you need a much unfortunately almost the wrong facility to do that because the interferometry makes looking for things that are very faint and very um it's not a survey telescope in that way you kind of need to know as, as was pointed out you need to know exactly what you're looking at and mm -hmm. to target it uh, you can't you could try to do a blind survey but i think alma would be less than enthusiastic about that because because so many of your detections would be not you you would have most of them would not be detected right yeah it's a challenge um, yeah uh, sort of to follow on that um, there's a question from uh, Peter um, I see that if, uh, what would our solar system look like to Alma if it were a hundred light years away or so uh, how many quote unquote of these rings does our solar system have right so our solar system actually as I mentioned 
the Kuiper belt is very rarefied. It, there, there's very little collisions going on in there. And, and partly uh, it may have been more massive in the past, right? Um, but there's a theory of sort of uh, the evolution of the solar system seems to suggest that it's been quite quiescent for quite some time. So there's not a lot of dust being generated in, in the Kuiper belt. That's why it would look so faint. Alma would have a terrible time detecting the Kuiper belt around a star if it was, you know, 100, uh, 100 light years away, right? It's just too faint. Um, and the other belt is the asteroid belt. So actually, um, there's actually three classes of dust that you might see. Cold dust from the Kuiper belt, warmer dust from the asteroid belt, where we know collisions are ongoing because uh, you can see asteroids occasionally disintegrate and things like that in the asteroid belt, but not that frequently. And, and it's, it's fraction, it's, luminosity relative to the sun is about the same as the Kuiper belt, so also very faint. But near the star, right, where you've got disintegrating comets and things like that, very close to the sun, you might have a chance of detecting those. And we do see those around other stars. So those are not a stable collisional evolution. They're like spontaneous disintegration, if you like. And they they are detected around about 30% of A-type stars. So you'll find a very hot component of dust right near the star around these mass, more around massive stars, like A stars, but you'll see it around 30% of them or so. Cool. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Matthews. Um, we do Thanks have to move along question. to our next uh, thing. We're running a little bit behind, but uh, thank you again for an incredible talk. And uh, I hope to see what the uh, next generation array will be able to do as well. Oh, me too. Thank you all. Thanks again. All right, let's move along to our uh, What's Up in the Sky with uh, Zorro. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And I'm going to be, uh, it's a beautiful, clear night. And so I, I, I know some of you probably actually want to get out and start observing. Uh, but uh, of course, we're going to be doing some online observing as well with uh, David and crew. And so I'll, I'll be brief here. I just want to, uh, oops, fortunately, my. My notes just stopped here. Uh, I'm just going to tell you for about five minutes about some of the things coming up this month. Uh, just to hit the highlights here, the, the sun is now uh, setting before 6 p.m., 5.57 tonight, and sunrise is just before 8, uh, 8 a.m., uh, 7.58. And so we're currently on Pacific Daylight Time and we'll be switching to Standard Time next Sunday, uh, which will continue until Sunday, March 13th. And uh, we all know the change can be very jarring, but uh, especially with the sunset suddenly getting before 5 p.m., but on the, on the uh, bright side, it will be sunny earlier in the morning. So uh, just as you can maybe see on my screen here, hopefully uh, this is centered okay, the, um, the planets are arrayed over in, uh, in the southwest, and you can see that Venus is, is, uh, is down there on the horizon just after, uh, just at the end of twilight. And this is the ecliptic, and you can see that, yes, indeed, they are uh, pretty much on the plane of the ecliptic in the sky, as you would expect. And, uh, but uh, unlike in the order in terms of the distance from the sun, you can see they go Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and just owing to our relative positions right now. And the, uh, uh, should just mention the moon's phase right now, it's a waning crescent uh, vis visible just before sunrise, and it'll be, at the new phase on the 5th, and it'll be full on the 19th when there'll be a near total solar, uh, pardon me, lunar eclipse. And that starts uh, before midnight, but peak eclipse will be just after 1 a.m. And I'll certainly try to uh, try to be watching that. And the, uh, the interesting thing that we can, of course, see up in the night sky is that the summer constellations are still visible at this time of the year, right after sunset. And uh, the reason that is, of course, is because uh, while we're continuing in our motion around the sun, sunset is getting earlier and earlier. And so this has sometimes been referred to as the persistence of the summer triangle here with Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And so the, uh, the, the next uh, two weeks will feature great evenings for, uh, for dark skies while the moon is out of the sky. And uh, another feature of this at this time of the year is that we can look at the summer constellations right after sunset and then uh, towards midnight, we're starting to look at the winter constellations. So it's a wonderful time to, uh, to look at a number of different skies here over the, 
uh, over the course of the evening. And tonight, of course, everybody is waiting with bated breath to see whether there's going to be a bright aurora. And I noticed that Joe Carr just posted on the RASC Facebook page that he did detect some aurora along the northern horizon, but that he was getting too cold. So he's going to go home for a bit and check back later because the, the main part of the, the, um, the particles from the sun, the CME, uh, coronal mass ejection has not apparently hit the magnetic field yet. There was some ionization yesterday, uh, I believe, from uh, the big solar flare that happened, the X1 class solar flare. And this is a much bigger flare than the, the ones that happened uh, back at the end of May, where we had about 10 C class solar flares that all happened very close to each other. And uh, that, that produced a, a fairly magnificent auroral display. This, this solar flare was about 100 times as powerful. And so um, if we do actually get hit by this coronal mass ejection uh, tonight um, or perhaps tomorrow, later into tomorrow, it should produce a very spectacular display. Uh, unfortunately, we can't entirely predict where these things are going. Sometimes they go a bit above the Earth or a bit below. And generally speaking, with a very massive flare, that's a good thing. Because, because they can cause a lot of disruptions. With the solar flare of this magnitude, it's possible that it'll start doing things like giving alarms on, on uh, voltage protection systems and so on. So they're, it's getting up into that realm. So uh, what we, we all certainly want to see a nice bright display of Aurora, but we don't want it to wreak havoc, havoc with our systems. Uh, the other thing that's uh, distinctive about uh, solar flares of this, uh, of this caliber is that they can actually cause the atmosphere of the Earth to expand a little bit and increase the drag on spacecraft in low Earth orbit. And so in this kind of situation, the, uh, you might have to reorient spacecraft a little bit. And this can actually also cause problems with uh, GPS and so on. So, so anyway, we, we can at least hope to see a, a better display of Aurora than is happening outside right now. So. With that, I'm just going to give it back to you, Aaron, and uh, we'll go from there. I can just step in. Uh, I just looking. The latest forecast is CME should hit us in just over an hour. Okay, oh, wow. great. There we go. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, yeah. So uh, at about uh, ten or ten thirty tonight might be a good time to step outside and take a look north. Um, Zorro, do you know of any uh, good points around uh, Victoria and the surrounding areas that might be a good spot to try and look at for the aurora? Certainly any place that's away from city lights and has a good view towards the northeast, I think, is good. I think a favorite for a lot of people is the northern side of Mount Ptolemy, and, uh, but certainly beaches and so on. Uh, Cattle. That Cattle, Cattle Point is a great place, as always, for night sky observing and so on. Excellent. That was Zorro's, Zorro's wife by the way, who just suggested that, so. Fantastic. All right, thanks very much. Hello. <laughs> All right, uh, so with that, we'll uh, head along to our EAA folks, our electronically assisted, uh, 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 electronically assisted astronomy. That one always uh, ties up my tongue uh, uh, for what they're looking at. And uh, if any of you happen to spot some Aurora, uh, with any of your scopes, or if you're looking out, uh, please let us know. Hi, everybody. So we haven't seen you guys for a while, but uh, I think uh, Brock and uh, David, uh, they've been busy. <laughs> so uh, the uh, best times, like uh, after we uh, did our big splash in August, uh, is probably some of the best uh, weather for uh, imaging, uh, except we're, we're taking a bit of a dive now. But uh, I think uh, David and uh, Brock were quite busy. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's just have a quick look. Uh, I think we have a mix of uh, deep sky and uh, Brock even captured some planets uh, recently as well. So let me just share my screen here. So I got a list of these things. Uh, do, you want us, you, do you want me to start you off, Dave? I'm just gonna bring up some of these things. Go right ahead, Dave. Okay. Yeah, that's not working very well. Let me try this. Do you want me to drive it? 
Uh, if you've got your stuff, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, you got the script there anyway, so. Well, it's not necessarily going to be in the order. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so a while back, uh, this is a, a, actually a mosaic I did of Andromeda, um, one of my favorite subjects. It's actually the, the galaxy that's closest to us. And uh, I, I really like this uh, um, image. It's, uh, let me just get some facts here. Um, it's actually the nearest galaxy to ours. And uh, when the first spiral nature of it was uh, photographed in 1893, it was thought to be a solar system being created. But uh, when uh, spectacular, Spectroscopy was put into, into play. We found that uh, the, the bits of the uh, spiral were actually moving very fast. And this whole um, system was moving at us at a speed of 100 kilometers per second. So really fast. And we also, uh, by looking at the stars, we were able to determine how far away it was. And... Uh, we came to the realization that it wasn't actually in our Milky Way system. It was a separate kind of universe or a separate galaxy away from us. Um, and uh, in 1943, speeding ahead, um, they were first able to resolve individual stars. And when I, f in the, in um, this galaxy, and when I first showed uh, this composite image, I would zoom in here a bit. I was asked if these little dots that we could see were actually stars. Um, so that was one question I wanted to uh, answer. And I couldn't really answer it at the time because the conventional wisdom is that all the stars you generally see in, in astrophotographs and most of the stars you would see when panning back here are actually within the Milky Way and not in the far galaxy itself. And the other thing I'd just uh, make a little note of is you can see little blotches of, of red here. And what these little blotches of red you see throughout the galaxy, they're star forming areas. They're indicative of um, hydrogen alpha emissions. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a second. But um, essentially, uh, to answer this question of could we see stars, I went back and created another image. These are all from backyard sort of equipment, by the way. Um, but uh, I took a close up of part of the, the image. And uh, what I was trying to hone in on was this little area in the center here called NGC 206. Um, and because these were known stars that you can actually see with your eyes through a telescope, but these blue dots that you see are uh, super massive stars, like 25 to even 50 times the size of the sun. Um, but not only could I see the stars in here, but you could see stars all through now, the big dots are, again, Milky, Milky Way stars, the big stars, but the very fine stars are actually stars in a different galaxy. So going back to a different image, this is all very exciting. I wanted to find out a little bit more about these uh, little red blobs. Um, um, and we have these red blobs inside our galaxy itself. And... Uh, inside our galaxy. And this is an image of one, um, one of these red blobs. It's, this is called the, the cave nebula and it's an emission nebula. And the red you see is actually this hydrogen that's being blown about by um, uh, stellar winds or, or energy being blown off by the stars themselves. And you see parts that are glowing bright red and that's where um, UV light mainly is being absorbed by the hydrogen and it's giving off, um, it's, uh, it's re-emitting that light 
according to its spectrum. Um, and you also see dark patches in here, and that's actually um, same sort of dust um, or, and or gases where there is no light um, reaching it. And it essentially blots out any stars in the background there. So getting back to galaxies for a second, these bright, bright red blobs are pretty few and far between in the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and uh, there's, they're actually more common in the Milky Way, our own galaxy. But there is a galaxy out there where it's just ridiculously um, concentrated how, how these red star forming masses of hydrogen, um, how, how uh, abundant they are. And this is the fireworks galaxy. It's about 10 times further away than the Andromeda galaxy, but it's known for uh, a couple of things. And it's kind of unique for, for a couple of reasons. One is the number of, of red star forming regions um, that you see in the galaxy. And you also see um, a, a lot of supernova occurring here. And uh, um, so it's been named, that's how it's got its name, the, the fireworks galaxy. This, so while the Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years away, this, this galaxy is about 10 times further away than that one. Um, so let me go back. Maybe I'll show you one more here. One more star forming region that I recently took um, would be lost it. over here. This is uh, another red star forming region that's, that's formed a, a shape that's reminiscent of a tulip, if you could, if you could imagine. Um, it's it's uh, very, very pretty. Um, the reason I'm showing you this too is because there's actually a black hole in this image. And this, this, this is in the constellation Cygna, C Cygnus. You've probably heard of Cygnus X1, which is a, um, a, a big X-ray emitter. It's one of the largest X-ray emitters in the sky. And uh, it's associated with some stars um, around a, a black hole. You can't see the black hole in this image. <laughs> I wish you could. But what you can see is a curved, this area here is where Cygnus X1 is, I hope hopefully you can see my crosshairs, but it's also forming a little bit of um, an arc here because um, the X-ray emission is somewhere around here and it's blowing this arc of material. So you can actually, you can't actually see the black hole, but you can see um, the effects that it's having um, around it. So to, to, to finish off, um, these are all images that I've been showing of things that have been processed. So we've taken the cameras and uh, we've taken the pictures and we tried to process them to bring the, the image out, what we want to show clearly out in, in the image. But we also undertake another kind of photography, which is EAA, which is looking at the pictures as they come out of the camera as we're watching them. And uh, I just thought I'd end up with, with showing you what's being taken right as we speak. This is, uh, this is known as the, the, well, the, the red part is known as a flying bat. It's in Cepheus and the uh, the interesting about this is another red star, red hydrogen rich area, but uh, 
what's caught people's imagination as of late is there's a, actually a, a, an oxygen emission taking place. It's a green color and it forms an outline of a squid and it's being dubbed the, the, the squid nebula. And we think it's emissions from uh, a, a trinary star system right here that's, that's blowing it out. We don't really have a great understanding, at least I don't have a great understanding of what's causing it yet. But I just thought uh, I'd show you what can be done on the fly with a camera. Um, and so I'm just stacking these images one on top of another as the camera's producing them um, every 14 minutes. So I've occupied enough of your time. I think I'll pass it on to uh, back to Dave or over to Brock or. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks Dave. I, I, I'm always ma amazed by your, your images. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very true. Like uh, a lot of the images that we see are products of uh, collecting a lot of data. So um, uh, the, the detail that we see is, uh, is a consequence of that. And, uh, but I'm also very interested in seeing images as they form. Because it's 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 kind of cool to uh, basically watch them develop in the darkroom, so to speak. So uh, uh, yeah, very fascinating. Just, just through the meeting, I just been seeing. Oh, it was another another image spit out every fifteen minutes, and I just been adding it to the stack. So yeah, that's that's excellent. Um, Dan Dan Posey couldn't be with us tonight, but I, I'd still like to. Oh, uh, Lori, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, I uh, David. Uh, what's the difference in the in the uh, distances between the bat nebula and the squid nebula? Uh, well, the, the the squid is nine thousand light years away, ninety three hundred light years away, and it's about two hundred and seventy one light years across. Now it's actually within the bat nebula, which is the red part. It's actually, right. it's actually, if you can think of a, a sphere expanding on the outside of the sphere is the hydrogen rich area. And on the inside is the oxygen rich area. So the stars have undertaken some sort of transformation in what they're giving off. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. thank you. The other thing is you're looking at the squid nebula underwater, right? So you got to be uh, <laughs> a little more distorted. Well, I, I I do dive, and I have a number of underwater photography uh, images too, but that's for another day. You, you, you're not taking your telescope underwater now, are you? No, sure? no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I was just I was just gonna say uh, Dan Dan Posey couldn't stay with us tonight, but. He did leave me with an image uh, that I, I think I would like to show you right now. So I'm just going to share that with you. So this is uh, now not I don't know if everybody knows, but uh, Dan works from deep downtown Victoria. So uh, this is taken from his uh, condo balcony. So I think he was using uh, special filters. Uh, this may have been one of the multiband filters uh, that people are using now. But uh, amazing detail of the lagoon. I uh, I, I have to admit, uh, uh, Dan is definitely a, a master processor. Do, do you have any comments, Dave? I think this came out when um, when you guys were talking uh, yeah. a month or so ago. Um, I think I had a go at processing this image as well as as Dan. Uh, I think you did too, didn't you, Brock? Or... Yeah. So uh, the the data was was very nice. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it, but it was also interesting data was interpreted three different ways by three different processors, mm -hmm. all trying to bring out different aspects of it. Yeah, I think we all have different. Well, first of all, we all have different eyes, and we definitely have different sensibilities as well. But that's the mm -hmm. the beauty of uh, astrophotography or even photography in general. That's great, um, Brock. Did do you want to drive or do you want me to bring I can up share it? I have it loaded up. So oh, great. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. 
Is there anything appearing? Yep, I can see a detail from yeah, so Andromeda. This, yeah, this is actually, Dave Payne talked about this exact region. And when he brought it up, I was like, oh, can I do that too? And uh, <laughs> apparently I could, not quite as clear as his, but um, I, basically the challenge was of course to see these giant blue stars and, and um, I managed to do it reasonably well. Um, you can see quite a bit of them and uh, it's pretty remarkable to actually be able to see stars in an actual different galaxy than our own. Now you, you're using a little bit of a smaller scope, right, Brock? Yeah, it's a slightly smaller scope. Um, and so the, you know, it doesn't have quite the resolution, um, but- um, That's still pretty the, good. Yeah, it, I'm, I was pretty happy with it. This, um, just for people's reference, this image actually would be basically the same size as a full moon. So this chunk of, you know, like how large each patch of the sky that is. Yeah, it, it's, an, is, it, it, it's an immensely large object. I, uh, yeah. I, I encourage beginners to go look for it with their binoculars because yeah. it's huge. Yeah, yeah, it, I've seen people have put, you know, scales of like the moon over top of Andromeda just for a size reference. And it, the entire Andromeda galaxy, I think, is like four or five moons wide or something. It's, it's very, very large. Although I've done with my own visual stuff, I, I don't think I can see it that width. I think I'm just looking at the core most of the time because unless you're in a really dark site and your eyes are really well adapted. I was just going to say, I think Peter Jedicke from London put something in the in the chat about the RASC having a having a uh, uh, an article on that. Peter, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm just trying to see. Uh... Okay. Yes, I am, Lori. Ah, yeah. Hi, Peter. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah. yeah th this was the NGC 206 when David mentioned it. I just wanted everybody to know if you want to read a little more about it, the uh, star clusters um, section of the Observer's Handbook in 2019 was devoted to NGC 206. Yeah, I see that in the chat. It's just there as a resource if anybody wants it. Great, excellent. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Excellent. So in September, one of the other things I went after was to try to get some, some more images of Jupiter and Saturn. And uh, this is a shot I got of Saturn. This is on this on September 23rd. And we had some reasonably good seeing. So uh, got out there and captured some data. And um, I was pretty happy with this one. It's um, not the best Saturn that I've ever taken, but um, it's still pretty good, uh, pretty good image quality. Yeah, just for, just for the audience's uh, sake, um... Uh, these planets don't occupy a very large area of the sensor. Uh, yes. We already have to magnify them a fair bit. Uh, so um, it's amazing what people do. Yeah, there was quite a bit of, uh, you know, if it was to use the entire sensor, it would be quite a bit smaller than this in the field of view. And I also got some reasonably good shot of Jupiter as well. Same night, actually. Oh, I was spot. just sort of, I would get about a minute and a half of video of each and just kind of go back and forth. And after getting about 50 gigabytes of video data, I was called it a night. Yeah. So, but uh, it is amazing the, the detail you can see with just a backyard telescope and some electronics. And a little bit of uh, selective processing. Yes. Some some amazing software that some guys have written. So I can't take much of the credit. It's mostly the software guys and telescope optic guys. <laughs> but, uh, um, this was actually uh, one of my bucket list uh, objects I wanted to capture this summer. It's called the Helix Nebula. And it's quite far, far to the south. It's in Aquarius. And it's a planetary nebula. It's similar to the well-known ring nebula, but it's, I don't remember the, I didn't write down the details, but I think it's something like 
three times closer and twice the actual diameter. So, you know, in the sky, it's much, much larger in the sky than the ring nebula. And so it fills the telescope up, whereas the ring nebula is just a little teeny thing that you see in the center of your uh, field of view. And um, actually, I like, I like the fact that you captured that uh, little bit of nebulosity below the main part of the image. Yeah, uh, so don't, this- You don't often see that. This is a planetary nebula. So it's basically a, the remnants of a dying star uh, and this actual white dot in the center is is the white dwarf left behind. And you can see this sort of glowing cyan uh, oxygen emission region. And then as in some of Dave's images, the more the outer regions are more uh, hydrogen gas, which has been excited by the high energy white dwarf emissions. And then there's this other wave front out here of hydrogen, which is quite faint, um, that, uh, that you don't often see, but there is actually quite a bit of detail there, and it's a really, it's a beautiful object. This is just so remarkable. I just love this image of yours, Brock. It's just <laughs> Brock, Brock, are you using any? Are you using any special filtration to get that level of detail? This actually, I think I, I may have just done this with no filters at all. Oh. Because I didn't have my NBZ at the at this time, and I so I think my only I, I, I'm pretty sure I just did it with no filters. Oh. It was a reasonably dark night. Yeah, that's that's remarkable. And then I also got um, a shot of the Pac-Man Nebula, which is it's a uh, one of those star forming regions that Dave talked about. So there's a number of young stars in here that are pumping out tons of high energy UV and, and other, you know, really high energy light. And, and they're basically exciting all sorts of hydrogen gas and some oxygen near the center, which it looks a bit white, but it's just the mixture of the sort of the cyan color of the oxygen with the reds. And then there's a band of this um, dark dust in, in the foreground which is it's an interesting, it, quite an interesting detail on it. It's, it almost looks like it's been exploded outwards. It's kind of a neat texture to it. And there's a blotch here that part of that same dark dust, but uh, it's, really, it's a really interesting uh, feature that I, I took last year and I didn't really like what I had gotten. So I was happy to get another round of it that worked out well. Yeah, you really have some nice dynamic range there. Are, are you doing any kind of masking or is this kind of straight out of the box? Uh, this is pretty much straight out. of This one would have been, I think by this shot, I think I actually did have my new filter. So. Oh, okay. I'm trying to remember. This might have been one of the first ones I did with my new um, dual lets the oxygen and the the sort of the cyan color from the oxygen and the red alpha. So that enables you to do uh, kind of narrow band stuff with a, with a one-shot color. Yeah, this is a one-shot color camera, but it gets similar to a narrow band, except rather than sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen, you just have hydrogen and oxygen. But, um, but it does allow you to get it done with a little bit less complexity than using a mono camera and a bunch of filter wheels. Yeah, def definitely a consideration here on the on the wet uh, coast. Yes, especially this time of year when you have very, very infrequent opportunities. Right. So, but yeah, so this is up in Cassiopeia. And then another shot that's up in Cassiopeia as well is this shot of the Fishhead Nebula. And this is actually, people have probably seen pictures also of the Heart Nebula, which is there's a heart and soul if you zoom out even further. But the, sticking off the edge of the heart nebula is this, this other area here, which is often called the fish head nebula because it sort of looks like there's a gill here and an eye and sort of a fish shape. But it's again, it's more hydrogen emissions and there's some young stars in here from the looks of it. And quite an interesting um, array of this dark dust regions, which are actually, I kind of wished I'd had a bit more of this area down here, but until I'd taken the picture, I didn't really realize there was so much texture down here. Mm -hmm. 
it is really an amazing region. And this was taken on September 23rd. And then I also got uh, the Wizard Nebula, which is again, another region with some young stars that are forming and exciting some hydrogen. And then a good mixture of the, uh, the dark dust lanes as well. So Brock, I hear you have a, a special image for us tonight. I do, I'm actually there's, well, the Wizard Nebula is a bit, you know, because it's a wizard, it's kind of got a bit of a Halloween theme. Actually, I've got a couple more and then I'll get to the, the one that I'm working on presently. Um, I did a galaxy, which is the Triangulum Galaxy, which is um, M33, Messe 33. And it, like the fireworks galaxy, although not quite as much like that, but it's similar in the way that it has quite a few of these star forming regions, mm -hmm. like Dave was talking about. So these nebula here, somewhere on a planet off this star here, there's probably somebody looking at this nebula in awe and sharing pictures on their, uh, on their own uh, evening of sharing yeah, images. They're, they're, they're not that uncommon, are they, Brock? I mean, we see them in the whirlpool as well. Yes. Yeah. And then I've got the, uh, the Sol Nebula, which um, my wife thinks looks like a buffalo. That's <laughs> probably not a bad name for it. Or it could look like a brain. Or a brain, yeah. Yeah. But uh, this is, again, it's yet another one of these beautiful star forming regions. And this was taken on uh, October 11th. And this is in Cassiopeia. We actually, that weekend of the um, October 8th, and when we, on the 11th, we also had a, another nice clear night. So. And then last night, and also at this very moment, I am collecting more data on this object, but this next one is called the Ghost Nebula. And I thought it would be the perfect Halloween um, nebula because it's kind of got some uh, sort of ghostly images on it. It's got something up here at the top that sort of looks like a ghost or some sort of bat or something. Yeah, it's, it's even got the right uh, color palette. Yeah, and then there's some sort of ghostly shapes here and almost human forms in these clouds here. Now that, um, grit, that grittiness is what you're hoping to go away when you add more data. Yeah, this is, these sorts of clouds of dust are very, very faint. And so because they're so faint, they, they are barely above the, the noise level on your sensor. So you need many, many, many hours of data. I'm gonna get about another 10 hours of exposure time on this tonight and uh, excellent and maybe by tomorrow afternoon i'll have uploaded a new version of this with, with without excellent. all that graininess yeah. and and it hopefully will have better resolution of the detail because right now it is it's very very noisy but it's a good preview of of what's to come so brock we wouldn't be mad if you added a pumpkin I know, that would be good. <laughs> well, tomorrow's Halloween, so you know, it's yeah. perfect timing. I'll have it already. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, think, um, I think I'm getting a signal here and I, okay. I, need, to, I need to get out as well. Uh, I've got a photometry assignment that I have to complete and I hear the rain is coming. So I Next week, think we yeah. all better get busy. <laughs> I'm gonna go out and see if I can find a spot to find some of Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Brock and Dave. And uh, thanks to Dan, wherever you are. Okay. Hey, good night. Good night. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dave, Brock and David. Um, fantastic images this evening. And I love the ghost nebula. Perfect for, uh, for Halloween. Um, oh, I should probably put myself on here. There we go. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to give a quick update for any of you who are hoping to look for Aurora. Uh, unfortunately, spaceweatherlive.com does not have an encouraging forecast. Um, the Aurora Oval is uh, fairly up north over Yucatan um, territories. Uh, I mean, it's fairly, Aurora are fairly unpredictable. That may change. It still might be worth trying to poke out, poke your head out uh, in the next half hour, look north, but. Um, 
yeah, uh, I wouldn't wait all night for them if, if you're going out. <laughs> Aaron, yeah. Um, it, so I asked Dennis about his source about 10:30. And yep. he actually didn't use space weather. He used the, uh, the, the space weather.ca site. And it does show the arrive. Uh, should be a storm around 1030 tonight. And I'll okay. try to pop the link uh, into here if I can. So, um, but I, oops, it's proving to be a little bit difficult to pop in. But anyways, um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, let me see if I can do that. Just hang on for two seconds yeah. here. Um, but I did see a graph that showed that it should, it's an awfully long link. Maybe I'll try this. You can put it into the zoo. Oh, that's not it. That's a, that's my job search stuff. I mean, that you don't want that. I don't know how we got that. <laughs> um, careful of what you paste, right? Yeah. I, I think the ghost nebula is having some effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here, here we go. This is it. So. There is a plot. Um, see if I can. If you go to the plot on the link that I put in the chat, mm -hmm. and it shows in the middle part there at about six thirty Universal Time, that. Uh, uh, oh, actually, I think that's right. I think that's right there. Yeah. Anyways. That the storm should be okay. You can, if you look over it now, you can see that the storm should be hitting fairly soon. Yeah. So I yeah, like I don't know next, how half hour next half hour. So yeah. And there's like about at least four hours when it's supposed to be storming according to this. Mm -hmm. But I agree that yeah, space weather's uh, spaceweather.com is not as optimistic. So. Yeah, well, it does say auroral and subauroral. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, so we're in the subauroral, so yeah, it looks like but it'll it, be it's unsettled. Although, so jumping so ahead, it's, one, it's uh, yeah, it does say pretty stormy. So yeah, maybe worth looking out in the next uh, half hour to an hour uh, if yeah. you're wanting to try it out for this evening. But uh, other than that, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, and thanks again to uh, uh, Dr. Brenda for her fantastic talk. Uh, thanks to our EAA folks and uh, to Zorro for telling us what's up in the sky. And uh, good night and uh, clear skies. Great EAA stuff tonight. Thank you. Bye, everybody. We'll see you on the 20th of November. Great. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Good night. Nice. Bye. Nice. Thank you. Bye.